collective insights as a voyage through topics and technologies revolutionizing human well-being. Groundbreaking approaches for a better world and a better life await you. Welcome to Collective Insights. Collective Insights and the work we do at Neurohacker Collective is made possible from the support of our community and the sales of our product, Qualia. Qualia is a comprehensive mental enhancement supplement designed to improve focus, mood, and flow state. Learn more about Qualia at neurohacker.com and use coupon code COLLECTIVEINSIGHTS20 for $20 off your first order. Welcome, everyone, back to the Neurohacker Collective podcast, Collective Insights. My name is Daniel. We are here with Dr. Jeffrey Becker today. Jeffrey is a medical doctor, psychiatrist, who has been focused in integrative and functional psychiatry for longer than uh, most people in the field, which means that he uses psychiatric medicines as one part of an integrative process where they are the best tools, um, typically with uh, deeper insights as to the underlying mechanisms that are involved based on deeper testing rather than just kind of uh, ESM protocols of the day. But that that is one of many processes along with looking at people's nutrition, their genetics, their microbiome, their overall health, um, you know, deeper functional testing, and then also integrating that with psychological practice. So uh, Jeffrey's a a pioneer in the field of integrative psychiatry, which is right at the center of the space that uh, we care about at Neurohacker Collective. And so Jeffrey, it's an honor to have you here today and thank you for coming. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for inviting me. It's been uh, it's been fun working with you, so looking forward to it. So the place I would like to dive in is ketamine therapy. Uh, you've been working doing ketamine-assisted psychotherapy for 13 years, I think, which is longer than most anyone that I know who's been working in the field. And, um, you know, we'll, we're, we can get into other areas of... Uh, psychotherapeutics and uh, functional psychiatry as it comes up, but this is such a possibly powerful tool for so many people um, and has just kind of come into more popular understanding very recently. Um, So I'd love to know, just overview for the listeners who aren't familiar, uh, what is ketamine? How do we start realizing that it had psychotherapeutic possibilities? What types of things can it be helpful for? Introduction. Mm-hmm. So, yes, I've been using ketamine in clinical practice for about 13 years. I became interested in it when I was in medical school, actually. Um, I studied mysticism in undergrad. Uh, I was a religious studies minor with a focus in mysticism. And what I ran into was really uh, very interesting descriptions of what ketamine did psychologically. And also I had read Um, some of what, uh, like William James describing um, nitric oxide and what that did psychologically, uh, and really saw a lot of similarities between some of what the mystics would describe and what people were describing with these dissociative anesthetics or NMDA receptor antagonists, basically. So I got uh, deeper into kind of trying to map uh, the similarities across these two fields, and then got deep into the neurology kind of as a result of that. Worked with Houston Smith at the time and a couple of other doctors and and advisors at UCLA and ended up developing uh, a comfort with uh, how ketamine works, with the potential that it might uh, bring as far as healing, um, psychological, spiritual, and it's turning out, I didn't know this at the time, but even um, even physical and molecular healing. and started using it. I went out and started to practice. I spoke with a number of anesthesiologists and, uh, and uh, became comfortable with uh, an approach and a protocol to using this um, kind of sub-anesthetic dosing. Um, it's kind of a twilight, uh, twilight anesthesia. There is some analgesia, at least. There's a lot of pain relief uh, in the ketamine treatment uh, that can be nice for some patients. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's a low enough dose that you don't have to have you know a lot of the um, kind of surgical protocols in place in order to use it. Um, what I've found over the years is that it can be uh, profoundly, profoundly effective for patients. And, and the research is now in the last 10, 10 years. Uh, I think I'm, I can't remember when the first paper came out, but 
we've got about 10 years of literature now and it's really exploding. I mean, it's a, it's a, an asymptote here or a, a, you know, hyper, hyper, <laughs> um, it's taking off the number of papers that have come out. So, um, as far as my use, what I have found most interesting um, is not just the immediate relief of depression, uh, which is profound and wonderful, but uh, what can be disappointing is that that sometimes fades in people. Um, what I have been focused on and interested in more is how to create lasting change uh, through the consciousness changes that, that ketamine can bring. And so uh, a lot of focus now on the symbolism and the kind of inner truths that come out. Uh, it's a little bit akin to what might might call psychedelic therapy. I think it's a bit different in that it's not as, it's not as easy necessarily to take and apply uh, the information that people get from a ketamine experience. It's a bit more, um, it's a bit more noetic and a bit, more ephemeral um, it kind of fades and um, we I find that people need tools and they need in a lot of times to kind of study ahead of time and study afterwards some of the phenomena uh, that are occurring so that they can they can place it properly and kind of create a new paradigm for themselves so. okay so <clears throat> just to make sure the basics are clear for most people ketamine is an anesthetic was primarily developed <laughs> as a anesthetic and it is used as a recreational drug in lower doses than anesthetic <clears throat> as a dissociative, um, relaxing, et cetera. And the psychotherapeutic properties were discovered after its anesthetic uh, use and most notably have been used for treatment resistant major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder. And typically it goes, give someone the drug, no psychotherapy, no noetic insights, one to two weeks of relief from depression. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like, obviously from a just straight up physiologic process, there is some kind of neurochemistry that is having some effect. But if you want it to last longer, what you're exploring is, is, is it just that it's changing biochemistry or is it changing biochemistry in a way that changes perception, meaning making identity, some aspects of kind of like computational rather than just chemical neuroscience, mm -hmm. where if the person becomes aware of it and applies it, it can be part of a psychotherapeutic process. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so that, yeah, that's been an interesting aspect of, of the debate is that a lot of the literature will describe the psychological effects as a side effect that just needs to be managed you know, that it's a negative side effect. It's something bad that we wish we could get rid of um, rather than using it to create leverage. Um, they see it as something that you should treat away. And in fact, a lot of, a lot of the centers will actually actively give agents that will reduce the, the psychological effects. And, uh, you know, uh, no, um, no judgment there. Some people, it's actually a bit much. They're not necessarily up for the level of information that, that Kennedy might bring. Um, and the psychological changes, it might be too scary for some individuals. But we are starting to find that if you treat away the psychological effects, it actually probably looks like the effects of ketamine are not as strong, uh, that it's not as antidepressant. So um, on a molecular level, we definitely see changes, increases in brain-derived neurotrophic factor. There's new synaptic connections. There seems to be kind of an... Un uh, a, a release uh, in uh, the frontal lobe, and, and you see a lot of activity in the frontal lobe, the anterior cingulate during the active, active treatment. Um, and afterward, you see uh, changes that look a lot like learning and, uh, and kind of new potentials, new potenti potentialities in terms of brain function. So it's really exciting that it's happening both at a kind of a body or a chemical level, at a mind level, and and for a lot of people at a spiritual level to get kind of an integration of body, mind, and spirit with a single treatment, that's uh, not often we get that in, in psychiatry, so it's fun. So the way you're describing it sounds exactly like the way I think about most categories of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, even though mm -hmm. psychedelic is so broad a category, it's almost meaningless um, in terms of the, mm -hmm. the types of psychological and physiologic effects. And so ketamine as a dissociative is only in the broadest definition related to that category. But if mm -hmm. we, what we're saying is 
using some kind of neurochemistry to create a state induction. And that that state induction provides different types of insights. And that those insights, if they are really brought to the surface, catalyzed, integrated, can be the basis for lasting psychological change. And so this is kind of chemical for psychological um, insight as opposed to just trying to permanently change a chemical state. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now, when you say, you know, some people um, try and treat away the psychological components. So we can easily imagine that as someone's dissociated and they start coming back, that there's questions around identity, questions around what's real, like deep existential types of things that come up. And if you don't know how to approach that, someone can get freaked out. Mm -hmm. But if you do know how to approach it, you can actually do really deep existential psychology with someone and help Mm -hmm. them have a better ontology of self and universe. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what you're doing with people? Yeah, I think that that the, the, the power with this approach, it really, it really, really folds out in two different ways. One is that the patient themselves become both prepared to receive information and um, are not as scared when it, when it arrives and, and um, look forward to and see as a process, you know, incorporating that into their lives and into their decisions and um, sometimes, again, I mean, I can tell, I, I probably would be smart to, to give you a couple of case, uh, case reports just quickly kind of to illustrate the point. But um, what I find is true is also that this is helpful to the clinician. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a busy practice in LA and sometimes I cannot get page enough time to actually do the treatment myself. And I have a couple of people that I trust out there that do a good job with patients. Um, and uh, it's been a couple of times where a patient has come out and they've had a fairly deep realization about something and, and there's a bit of a, a mourning quality, a, a sense of loss of like, wow, I didn't know that I that I had given up that, that power or given up that aspect of myself or forgotten that aspect of myself. Um, and the tears that they shed when they come out scare the clinician. And the clinician in a couple of instances in the next treatment would give the patient without really explaining to them something to kind of kind of dampen the effect of the ketamine. And I, I had to explain to my patient that you scared them, you know, you scared them. You need to reassure them that it's okay. And that you actually, you know, you got something from that and that you, you don't need, you don't need to, to, you know, make it go away or, or that it's okay. And that's been interesting to hear that the patients kind of all of a sudden become part of the process um, and the clinicians, I would imagine, probably enjoy that. It's not, it's not fun to kind of, I, I don't personally like the paternalistic, you know, that relationship. I find it to be, I think it creates a lot of discomfort for, for both parties. So, so I would love to yeah. hear some case studies. <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think I have a really, I have a really interesting one that um, is, I think it's, it's kind of a perfect case, case study. So I, um, I was working with a woman for years, uh, and she was what you would say is chronically depressed, but what I would say, actually, if you look at it more on a spiritual level, she was in despair. Um, <clears throat> there was a, a loss of meaning, a loss of a sense of purpose, um, a sense of adventure in life and agency and, um, kind of an authentic integration is that she was kind of hiding out. What was interesting was that she was very aware of death. Uh, even as a child, she said that she would see death in life all the time. They were always intertwined. And as she got older, became an adult, she would find herself repeatedly at people's bedside when they were dying. You know, other family members Sometimes the direct family member, sometimes she was only a friend. They somehow find a way to get out of the room when the person was about to die. And somehow she'd be the one that would be there and she could handle it. She could mm. be holding her hand as it would happen. Now I could see this in her. This was an unrealized kind of latent gift, you know, that she didn't quite know what she was. And we were kind of working through it, but there wasn't, um, and she, she got it, but it wasn't something that had a mandate behind it, this insight did not have 
um, the kind of power that could change her life. Um, well, she eventually she opted into trichotomy, and the first session she came out and she she actually was just kind of radiant, and she said it was the first time she felt like she was cradled by God for the first time in her life for you know an, an hour that felt like an eternity in the moment, and that was wonderful, obviously. And um, the next session. She came out and she was overwhelmed and actually it took a while for her to kind of come out. She started, she started to cry and it was, it took a while to come out of that. And we talked a little bit about what was going on and she said, I'm okay. Um, but I just didn't know what I was. And when she said what I was, it really was about her being. Uh, it wasn't about, you know, what she thinks or what she knows or what she you know, believes, or this is that. It was much more about what she is at the, at the at a primary level of being. And in the third session, she came out and she basically made sense out of it. And I think it's like a perfect triptych. You know, she came out of this third session and she said, I should have been a nurse. And this is a woman who was in her early 50s and had no science background. And she found this information, this insight, this, this experience of her true being so powerful that she went back to City College and did Science Corps and ended up going and becoming a nurse on a full scholarship at a major university. They were so amazed by her that they just said, please come and we'll pay for you. And she's ended up in nurse leadership and she's out. And, and when I see her now, it's it's... It's really powerful. What's interesting to me is that she's still sad, but there's no problem with meaning anymore. Her life is deeply meaningful, and that's the difference. You know, one could look at her and say, she, well, she's still depressed, and she's not depressed. She's aware of death at a level that she will never escape, and now she's doing something with it. And it's mythic. It's powerful, powerfully mythic work that happened. And three treatments, a total of three hours. So just that's the kind of that. That's a very extreme and a very clean. I like I like how clean that you know the the that case report is. But you see these kinds of you see these kinds of stories when you work in this field. It's really it's really powerful. I think the distinction that you make here is actually a really interesting one, which is uh, there is a restoration of meaning for her without removing sadness, because sadness can sometimes be just the appropriate emotional response to reality. Yes. Yeah. sad, And if she's focusing on those things that can be there, but there can be a certain kind of um, love, joy, fullness, along with the sadness, right? If, if there is a framework for it. So this is very much like a, existential psychotherapy tool in this case. Mm -hmm. I've heard a lot of people describe that the process of kind of experiencing something that was akin to parts of what they thought death might be like and experiencing kind of the rebooting of layers of self <clears throat> that started to come as, the, as they were kind of turned off and came back online and they could see them uh, actually helped them address fears of death they had. Is that something that you found is mm -hmm. a common capability? Absolutely. Um, I think that, uh, so the paradigm that I use when I'm working with patients is union and that basically we are made up of a duality. We have our ego, which is a, a smaller, um, the smaller aspect of our wholeness um, that is in many ways, kind of based in, in fear, in striving, in, um, in you know, predictive anxiety and, and trying to get things done. We need this part of ourselves to pay the rent and hunt for nuts and berries and compete in a competitive world and, you know, do things that we don't want to do uh, sometimes so that we can be safe. Um, you know, it's not always a safe world. So uh, we need this badly, and yet it's also very alienating. Uh, it's very alienating from a much, much richer core, which would be 
uh, you might call it the unconscious if you're, if you're talking more of a Freudian, but it's, uh, it's the self in, in Jungian in the Jungian paradigm. So you have the deep self, um, which is a rich, it's a richness from which what we are comes. And then we have the ego, which is a, a diminished um, subset of that wholeness that can become alienated from the original whole. And what I strongly believe is that ketamine is kind of an ego solvent. It kind of, it kind of dissolves the ego um, the pyramidal cells in the brain, they're, they're heavily controlled by a, a GABAergic inner neuron net, um, basket cells, chandelier cells, these cells that control the pyramid cells, sometimes actually with an axon around the axon, inhibitory around the pyramid cell. They're called exoaxonic cells or chandelier cells. Um, that this over-restrictive inhibitory tone um, once it's lifted, people experience what they are. And then as the ketamine leaves, they start to see the programming come back on. They start to remember, oh, yes, I'm a father or a mother. or Oh, yes, I'm a doctor. And I mean, if you go far enough, it'll be, oh, yes, I'm a human. You know, that might be the starting point. Um, and uh, it's kind of, it is fascinating to see those programs come back on board. I, I will... I will point that out to people is watch and realize how many of these premises are negotiable, that maybe they're not useful anymore. Some of the premises about how you see yourself might be something that you, we can work through and, and let go of. It might be old programming. Okay. So I'm curious regarding the um, neurophysiological mechanisms of action. <clears throat> you were just talking about mm -hmm. inhibiting the inhibitory neural cells and neural networks. Um, I think I usually think of ketamine largely as a NMDA antagonist, specifically glutamatergic more than acetylcholinergic antagonist. Um, and <clears throat> the cells that you're mentioning, the, the chandelier cells, basket cells are primarily GABAergic networks. Um, obviously there's a glutamate GABA interaction. Can you speak a little bit to what we currently understand regarding the mechanism, the physiologic <clears throat> mechanisms of action? And I heard you saying something around inhibiting the inhibitory processes so that something is kind of freed up so that mm -hmm. there's some type of pyramidal cell activity that gets to increase. I, I'm curious to just hear you talk on that. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, for, for, for most people to, to take a step back. So, you know, the vast majority of what, of what we would call thinking is, is simply at, a, at the simplest level. It's pyramid, it's pyramidal cell excitation and pyramid cells talking to each other and, and interrelations and nets of, of relationships, um, that are linking to deeper structures, to emotional structures, to, to physiology, to high cognition, and kind of linking up a lot of different ideas to become kind of a whole experience. Um, these pyramid cells are uh, excitatory in, in, their, in, their basic, in their basic nature, and there, there does need to be a controlling process over them. Um, and this controlling process um, is generally we consider it at, at the simplest level. There's a lot of complexity to this, of course, it always is, but um, at the simplest level, we will sometimes call it a GABAergic inner neuron net. And what we mean by that is GABAergic, GABA, G-A-B-A, is gamma amino butyric acid. And that is the amino acid neurotransmitter that is inhibitory. Um, GABAergic receptors will flux, uh, flux uh, chloride and will kind of make it more difficult for a neuron to fire. So when a GABAergic neuron kind of talks to a neuron, what it's doing is saying, hey, quiet down. And these GABAergic inner neurons, we say it's an inner neuron net in the sense that they are kind of all over the place and it's a net, not a tract. So when we have neurons that start in one location and kind of crack to another location, um, that's kind of different than this. This is more of a, of a whole interwoven fabric um, these neurons talk to each other um, as if to say, hey, you know, I'm turning off that thought. Are you turning off that thought? Yeah, I'm going to turn it off. Are you going to turn it off? And um, they all are kind of sampling what each other is doing 
And a lot of what they're doing, again, is, is inhibiting certain, certain thoughts, certain patterns, certain ways of, of thinking. And so what's an odd bit of, of kind of logic here is that if you think about what it might be if you were to lift that off, that's what I would say you could say that you are. I don't know what we are other than, you know, just the gestalt of experience, right? What is, what is kind of interesting is that at a logical level, if you have this inhibitory net that takes what you are and makes it smaller than that, then in some ways, if that's the ego, if what's left over is the ego, then the ego could be seen as what you're not, not. You know, most of the time we don't use double negatives in language, but in logic, it can be very, it can be very specific and appropriate, obviously. So I think that ego is what we, be, what we are not, not in the process of this inhibitory tone, and the self is what we are. And ketamine allows us to stop being what we're not, not by inhibiting the inhibitors and allowing them right. to be released from constraint. Now, the first person experience of that is obviously going to vary from person to person, from session to session, and based on dosage. But typically, the first person experience of that, how would you describe it? <clears throat> um, I, th I think what is interesting is that the very beginnings of ketamine experience is often described as feeling like one's had a drink. And what's interesting is that alcohol does have an NDA receptor antagonism in it. So there's something familiar about it for people, but what ends up happening um, with a full, with a real treatment is that it goes a lot deeper and there's kind of like a, Oh, and a, a kind of releasing of, of layers and layers of basic, premise programming and there's an experience that is kind of nonverbal. Um, I again have kind of gone to Jung to kind of understand what the space is because he described it so well. Uh, what people are really interacting with in the ketamine space are archetypes. It's the, it's a symbolic world and archetypal in an archetypal space consciousness and as such, it's really not a language-based space. And if people try to speak too much, it will very, very quickly diminish what they're experiencing. The meaning will, will kind of wisp away and become, you know, difficult to hold on to. It's hard enough to grasp anyway. So, um, and that's a wonderful thing to work with with people is to open them up to the idea of what, what archetypes are as, a, as, a, as a, different, a different way of understanding what knowledge is you know, maybe even knowledge with a G, you know, so. So one of the things I've heard people describe often in their first person experience when they were uh, specifically treating for depression mm -hmm. was that the usual experience of the world as themselves, they have uh, the, the narrative they're running is all gone. And so there, and yet there was not nothing. There was consciousness that was aware of something. Mm -hmm. And then as they started to come out of the experience, because oftentimes the, the, the height of the experience is so different than normal consciousness that you can only remember a fragment of it, like dreams. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but as one starts to come out and normal consciousness is booting, it boots in layers. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like they notice language booting again and they notice the coordination of perceptions and then perception and motor capacities, right? So they start getting agency in a world before they get their normal narrative of self, which is why bad shit is always happening to them, why nobody loves them, why they're not, not enough, whatever, that that shit boots later. And so there's a while where they're experiencing the world and able to act in the world without that normal dysfunctional narrative self layer that they've had and they get to realize that in that time, they're not depressed. And then when that narrative layer starts to boot again, the depression kicks back on. And Absolutely, because yeah. they have a reference frame for being without it, which they might have never had before, they get to be, oh, I'm actually depressed because of a pattern of perception and meaning making. 
and yeah. it change that. So then they have to go and do deeper CBT or DBT, whatever other processes to change that. But it gave them a reference frame experientially that they didn't have. Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's a lot of power in, in receiving a map, you know, and to actually have gotten a chance to kind of look at where you want to get to before kind of just kind of shooting for something you don't know where it is yet. I mean, how do you find your way? So, yeah, that is a very powerful experience for people. Yeah. Um, and that what you're getting at is actually, it's, it's why I actually will, when I'm working with people, I will explain that um, doses that get someone just into the transpersonal space and not so far out um, can be actually more useful psychotherapeutically uh, because of that type of work of being able to experience themselves with maybe one foot still on the earth um, can act as a bridge. If people go too far, sometimes they're actually confused enough when they're coming back in that that's not, that's not useful. And in fact, actually the stuff comes on um, at from such baseline layers that they don't actually get to make sense out of it until they're almost out of it completely. So yeah, it's it's interesting. There's a lot now about what's the what's the best dose and, and all of that. I think there's it's I think some of it is a little bit um, Western medicine tends to want to nail stuff down a little bit too tight sometimes. This is not this is such a powerful tool. I don't know that it's gonna be so simple, but but I think there is something that different people uh, kind of need different experiences. But that being said, I do. There are practitioners out there that really believe in the strong doses, powerful, powerful dissociative effect, and trying to basically create a deep religious experience uh, for for the patient and help them help them experience that. That that's actually where the healing is, and I do too. I just don't know that it needs to be quite as aggressive as as uh, some of what's going on out there. You know, I don't personally have quite as much experience with. Uh, the dissociatives like ketamine I have uh, a lot of experience myself and other people with um, 5-MeO-DMT and with the whole range of traditional kinds of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy uh, LSD, MDMA mushrooms, ayahuasca, etc and they're all meaningfully different like they, they all have a meaningfully different set of um, general benefits indications um, but they all kind of share the process of disrupting normal perception and identity and then giving someone a reference frame of a different possibility yeah. and getting to recognize how much someone isn't experiencing reality, but it's experiencing a perceptually narratized or distorted version of reality. Mm -hmm. And then they get to recognize that they actually have the power to change the, those perceptual frameworks. That seems to be, one of the things that's kind of common to all of the um, state altering psychotherapeutic processes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is really, if you think about what that means, I mean, it's a, it's a teacher, which is wonderful. I mean, that you can actually, you know, receive instruction like that. You know, some teachers tell us stuff we don't want to hear, but it's a, uh, you know, it's funny because you were talking about having worked with this lady for a while and then three sessions, what she got. Mm -hmm. I had a friend recently have their first uh, ayahuasca ceremony and she said, a bunch of shit that you've been saying to me for four years made sense for the first time. Right, right. It, it kind of cognitively made sense, but couldn't cross the chasm of having any experiential reference where the, where the idea grounded and then it grounded and then it automatically became meaningful in a way that it wasn't before. And that's, that's kind of one of the things I think is most special about it is someone hearing that their perceptual meaning making framework is what creates their emotional reaction is mm -hmm. very different than actually not having that emotional reaction or that framework, right? Like it's mm -hmm. a very, it's, a, it's tasting the strawberry versus having some idea about the chemistry of a strawberry and never having tasted one. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. That's right. I really, I always point, some people will ask me, you know, they'll say, what, what would you recommend uh, that I do? I'm thinking about, you know, taking mushrooms with a friend or, you know, and, you know, beyond kind of the basics of 
the safety and set and setting and, you know, just making sure that you trust who you're with. I often will tell people, you know, just get, get any weird stuff out in the open ahead of time. Don't, you know, don't, don't have there be something unsaid that needs to be said. Uh, those are just good kind of clean, clean psychic practices. But um, at the minimum, I just say, read, 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 you know, there's some wonderful minds, you know, from the secular humanist kind of American, amazing American era that produced some of the most amazing writing that yeah. you'll probably ever see. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think that that can be a great, if you're, you know, if you're going to go on, if you're going to go to Europe, you, you get a guidebook and you, you read the best guidebook you can find if you're smart, right? So Now, are you mostly uh, referencing... Groff and Huxley and Shulgin and these folks. Yeah, and uh, Houston Smith and um, I definitely, yeah, appreciate appreciate those guys a lot. I really, really thought they were special people. Um, okay, so I'm curious to just do a little more on ketamine therapy, and then we'll expand. So. Uh, and, and uh, excuse me, one part on the psychedelic assistant psychotherapy, doing the ex experiencing the chemical and knowing how to actually interpret the experience afterwards are totally different things, which is why set and setting and facilitation make so much difference. Mm -hmm. um, if someone takes a psychedelic and they see things that look like demons, and they're told that that's because in the astral planes, demons are after them. Then they're scared and they need like crystals and metaphysical tools and whatever. If they're told that that's a symbolic representation of stuff they're afraid of, like maybe their dad from childhood and they go face it and the demon turns into dad, then turns into dad's inner child and they recognize the legacy of trauma and whatever. The meaning making of what the symbolism is determines pretty much everything, right? Like in terms of what they're going to lastingly encode, the experience itself is much less important than what they harvest from it, which is why getting the right facilitation is such a big deal. So I don't generally just recommend people to go, yeah, go experiment with chemistry on your own, go experiment with psychedelics. Like it's important to actually know that you're getting facilitation for how to interpret the experience as well. You want to say anything about that or? Oh, I think it's, I think you really, you said something very, very important here um i i think that this whole arena is it's so powerful that it's not a surprise that there are kind of niches and nooks and crannies that people can live in that maybe shouldn't be shouldn't really be given power in the space and and you know i i hear stories that make me sad sometimes about people being taken advantage of and and um and I think that the the kind of the, the capacity for people to fall prey to kind of the guru trip, um, both on both sides, either either wanting to be a guru or wanting a guru to turn to, um, I think I think we we need to be careful. Any anybody always needs to be very careful with that. It's a very dangerous model. I think it can be okay, but it's it's sometimes not, and, and, and I don't I don't, I don't really have any any you know perfect rules on how to sort sort it out because I think humans are are complex and, and so um, yeah it's it's a it's you know it's a wild west out there it's <laughs> it's hard to know how to guide someone towards you know towards the right fit for them. But I think maturity, maturity in the guide in the guide is of the utmost. It's it's very very important. And I think if if you look at their life and you don't see the signs of maturity, um, I think you need to be very careful because you know it's what people do, not what they say. Really, that one should turn to if you're looking for data about that. Yeah. Now you you implied something that's actually a really tricky thing to look for, which is when you talk about the uh, practitioners who want to 
actually treat away the psychotherapeutic process and tr take it as a purely chemical effect and say like, no, no, please don't have existential inquiry, mm -hmm. that that ends up not being good. And the ones who don't actually probably understand neuroscience well or at all, um, and maybe don't even understand what modern psychology has started to piece together around um, the way the psyche and the nervous system interact, mm -hmm. then they end up getting kind of regressive, weird metaphysics. And so you've got like on one hand, you've got people who are looking at something that could be called an existential or spiritual level, but usually pre-scientific, pre-rational with a bunch of weird ideas, mm -hmm. the guru trip thing. And then you have people who are looking at it from a scientific, but then also reductionist existential flatland point of view. And those are the two options and they both suck. <laughs> and, so, so there is another option that says, how do we actually understand right. the nature of existence, existentialism self in a way that is also uh, not irrational and that is congruent with what we understand about science, the right. brain, et cetera. And it kind of, someone has to do both of those to do a good job in the space. It's, it's exactly where I was coming from about why I love those secular humanists because they were, they were deeply heart based they were deeply mature, most of them. Um, and they were so smart. And you put those things together and you've got a good guide or teacher most of the time. I think that's a pretty good starting point, at least. And um, I mean, I have to say, I have turned much more to people that no longer are alive and just read what they had to say for my own, for guidance in my life than I have actually found in individuals. Um, I did, again, I worked with Houston Smith for years, so he, you know, I was very lucky there, um, but I'm minded that way. I, I just, I can get so much from, from reading um, that, and I think a lot of that literature is being forgotten. It's really, I'm surprised at how much people are just turning to kind of derivative sources now, stuff that's being kind of rehashed in a, in a, a very, very diminished form. In my opinion. If the listeners here were interested in um, some kind of uh, psycho-spiritual explorations that mm -hmm. seem to be well-grounded with what neuropsych knows, what are some of the books you might recommend as good starting places? Yes. So, yeah, if you, if, if, if one wanted to dive into this duality model in a way in a book that's was when it was written was considered a lay book I, I find that a lot of people are surprised that that was a lay book you know 30 40 years ago but ego and archetype by edward edinger is just astounding how good it is how how deep and how accessible i just feel so grateful for that man i, I am amazed at his, his ability to translate Jung into understandable terms and to, and to really ground it in experience and symbolism of human beings over time in multiple different cultures and poems and to, to bring you over and over again to an, and this understanding of this kind of loss and then recapture of what is lost um, through kind of moving through a liminal state. So, you know, adolescence is, you know, is kind of associated with this, this aching, painful becoming, um, which can feel very constrictive and very uncomfortable. And then if we stay in the game and if we stay conscious and we stay brave, we will often find in our often late 20s, early 30s, that there's a kind of a reawakening to one's own original kind of untarnished self or the child, or we have a lot of models for this, but uh, some, some people don't find that again. And, and actually a lot of, a lot of people for, don't realize they've lost something. They forget that they've lost something. And that is, again, I think is that's a different form of despair. Um, it's a little different than what I was describing in, in that case report, but I think, there are lots and lots of people that are in that state that don't quite realize why 
there's no things aren't shiny anymore and you know that this is is this it kind of thing um so yeah finding finding that finding that process within yourself and identifying it within your own life so that that symbolism can get laid upon your own personal version of that universal story um, I think ego and archetype is extremely powerful. I think um, Houston Smith's book, The Forgotten Truth, is is very special. Um, if one wanted to dive deeper into mysticism per se, which is a very specific um, interdisciplinary study and religious studies, obviously, but um, Stace's book, uh, Mysticism and Philosophy, or Happold has a book uh, called Myst- Mysticism, um, as well, that can be found. I think one of them's out of print, but they're both they're both quite special in terms of being accessible. Um, yeah, those are those are my uh, I would those are my desert island books. Mm-hmm. Good, thank you for sharing those, and uh, we'll put them in the show notes for people. <clears throat> so, in addition to people being able to notice their ego structures as they reboot their perceptual meaning making frameworks one of the other things you're mentioning that i think is one of the key aspects of uh ketamine therapy for many people is this kind of um reintegration of parts that were fragmented Mm -hmm. and so whether it was sexual trauma so parts of sexuality turn off or whether it was betrayal so parts of the capacity for trust or attachment turn off or different things like that um whether it was uh you know wrongful punishment so parts of like curiosity and innocence and off there is definitely a disintegration fragmentation of self and dampening of total aliveness Mm -hmm. that happens from those unresolved traumas Mm -hmm. and so one of the things you're describing is that people when they're doing ketamine oftentimes recognize that even if they didn't know that was happening Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it's what, what's been so, uh, I don't know what the word is fun. I mean, it's just the, the confirmational experience of watching patients over and over again, come up with these deep principles and say them in the room and have it be as if it's this, it's, it, you know, you can find the same principles and writings from Teresa Avila or, or Eckhart or, uh, you know, the, this idea of, of fragmentation and kind of collecting collecting one's power back into one place so that they can kind of become themselves, this, this kind of mythic, mythic transformation. Um, to see them getting that on a, on a gut level, it's just, it's just a lot of fun to watch. It's special. I feel really lucky when those moments happen. I mean, if you go to, you know, in, in Kabbalah, the idea that God's light was so powerful that it, it kind of broke the lenses when it came in, that, that, that we were supposed to be able to focus the light out into the world, and we have to go and collect the shards and put it together to, to, bring, to bring order, and that that is what we're here to do. It's not that that's an accident. That's, the, that's what it is to be here. So all of a sudden, it's exciting. Instead of, you know, just woundedness for woundedness sake, it becomes, that's the source of meaning that we need to, we need to, we need to make sense out of in our lives as we move through. That's our story, you know. Mm-hmm. All right, well, we could go down a very deep hole of um, existential meaning making and its relationship to woundedness. Uh, and that would be a fun <laughs> place to go but i'm i i'm curious to get back to um with ketamine if we're just looking at the physiologic benefits independent of the insights Mm -hmm. um and of course in a way that even talking about physiology psychology is um a less clear distinction than is real because when we talk about psychology from a neuroscience point of view, we're talking about computational neuroscience, which mm-hmm. is you know, changing neural network algorithm patterns, um, which are, of course, related to 
but at a, at a deeper level of process than the type of neurochemistry of what's happening in cytosynapses. Um, but <clears throat> as we just look at the physiologic effect, no psychotherapy happening, there, there is interesting phenomena like BDNF upregulation and um, neuroplasticity type chemistry that is going to have some effect on brain structure neural structure independent of anything else. Mm -hmm. So the, there are definitely groups that are doing great work on this. They're showing increases in, in, again, synaptic strength, kind of new synaptic growth. They're showing, you know, new relationships and areas of the brain that kind of turn on. Um, uh, my tendency is definitely more on the kind of mind and, and kind of archetypal spiritual kind of arena in terms of kind of understanding it. But uh, one thing you see very much in the body when people become not depressed for whatever reason, it's actually not just ketamine. You see this, you see this, it's, it's kind of astounding to watch how much kind of somatic distress disappears and how there become kind of liberated energies that can be, channeled in lots of different ways. You just see people's, you know, their posture changes and their facial expression changes. And, you know, they, they move more quickly and they get up more quickly and, and they're just, there's life in their, in their, in their body as well as in their mind. And you definitely, it's kind of powerfully see that with ketamine and you see that in the hour that it, that it happens, you see people sit up and, you know, instead of kind of having a kind of a broken, defeated, uh, you know, posture, you know, that will all of a sudden sit up with kind of a strength and a, and a, a determination um, in their, in their posture that's, that you hadn't seen before and things like that. So um, it, it, I think they're going to find out a lot in these next 10 years about what's going on. And I think I, I welcome new treatments that, you know, maybe are, don't have the difficulty of application uh, this isn't easy for people to get into the office and, you know, two do two hours of doctor's time and, you know, all the safety protocols and all that between the expense and the opportunity cost. Um, I, I think it'll be, it'll be good when they sort out exactly what's going on on a molecular level, because hopefully it'll open up new treatment avenues. So with regard to what's happening in depression, depression is obviously too wide a term to be meaningful. Um, but we'll just use it generally for now. Uh, two fields in medicine that have really kind of advanced in recent years is looking at depression as an inflammatory condition. So kind of the rheumatology, uh, neurology intersection, where there are types of depression that are almost thought of as rheumatism of the brain or of the nervous system. And we're looking at upregulated inflammatory molecules, cytokines primarily that can cross the blood brain barrier, cause inflammation in the brain and affect chemistry pretty widely. <clears throat> and then also cell energy dynamics and where we're looking at either decreased ATP output or decreased some part of the Krebs cycle or the redox process or something of cell energy leading to depression. When you're talking about seeing the person move better and obviously we start thinking about inflammation or be more vital, we start thinking about things like, you know, cell energetics, not just top down neurological effects. Absolutely. Yeah. Now I know in your practice, you know, we, started talking about ketamine because we haven't talked about it on this podcast yet. And it's a super interesting topic, but it's just one of lots of tools that you use. Um, and it's also my understanding that oftentimes it's not the first tool you use. And that from a physiologic point of view, addressing things like neuroinflammation and cell energetics are some of the things that you look at. Yes. Commonly. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Process wise, it's been interesting over the years for, to just to watch, watch, you know, the growth of my, the breadth of my expertise uh, kind of allowed really a re-engineering of how I approach things. I, I started much more top down um, being kind of more spiritually oriented to start. Uh, and what I have ended up doing is actually very much the opposite. I now start really down at the molecular level, um, do a deep workup on kind of metabolism. We do genetics. Usually I use 23 and me. I've been a bit, bummed out by the new chip it's it's not nearly as as deep a read and they 
categories I, I had grown to appreciate, but still using it as the best thing out there currently. Um, or most affordable and easy, I guess. There's, there's other things out there, but... Um, and then if you marry that to good clinical work, um, really identifying symptoms and patterning and understanding how physiology, physiology interacts, kind of coming up with a plan to help people with uh, whatever is causing the system to not be working as well as it might. You know, I think, and I just keep it that simple. I, I, I don't know that I'm going to cure anything, but I think, you know, if we can get the basic healing principles that we know work in the human body uh, at work for us. If somebody's not sleeping or has, you know, such disturbed sleep that they're not getting their deep sleep and their growth hormone levels or IGF-1 levels are low and they have fibromyalgia, you know, big surprise is their tissues are sore and achy in the morning when they're not sleeping. So let's get them sleeping and, and then we'll see what happens. And, you know, why are they not sleeping? Well, maybe they have, um, insulin problems and they're getting low blood sugars and you know we really need to change their diet we need to really help them move away from carbohydrates and more towards fats and protein for fuel um, maybe we have a problem with b12 is normal but they have the mtr double copy and you know their methionine synthase is oxidizing itself so quickly that that uh, they can't methylate properly even though you know their their b12 and folate levels look normal um, so sometimes tr treating those things directly, or that would be empiric to some extent. Uh, you know, the labs might not go up. One thing I've learned is that labs can lie. You're looking in one compartment of the body in a single moment in their day, and then you're extrapolating to completely different tissue compartments like the brain, which are known to have massive gradients of vitamins across, across that, uh, that blood-brain barrier. So it's a bit silly sometimes over-relying on labs. So I have a question with this. <clears throat> um, when we start to look at genomic personalized medicine, obviously if we're looking at someone's genome, 23andMe or Illumina or whatever we're, we're using, yeah. that's the same when the person was a uh, Olympic level athlete and when they had cancer, right? Like that's just mm -hmm. the genome. It's not their genetic expression at all. Yeah. Now their genetic expression, which is being affected by everything, right? By their um, psychology, by their lifestyle, by their chemical exposures, by everything else. <clears throat> we don't have like a real easy way to test transcriptomics or proteomics writ large. Um, metabolomics is still a very early field. Um, yeah. So we look at, we look at clinical chemistry for whatever markers we're looking at. And the genomics can tell us one little part of predisposition. But if I see that gene, whether how that's expressing, I don't, I don't fucking know. So for me, I don't really want to ever see somebody treat based on genes. I want to see them factor genes as along with the actual clinical chemistry and presentation. Right. Is that how you think about it? It's basically, yes. Uh, you know, in a nutshell, um, I'll give you, uh, let me give you a, a, an example of, of, you know, actually a case I just had last week, uh, which was someone that had been a very powerful competitor in gymnastics and was able to endure a lot of pain and work hard and, you know, <coughs> found that they started to feel bad in their 20s, mid-20s, and really, really crashed when they were in, in their early 30s. And when we look back at their history, um, we saw some of the signs of this with, with problems with tissue repair compared to their friends, that something in their psyche caused them to push through, uh, but their career did not go the way that they wanted it to because of problems with cartilage and tissue and, and, and you know, when they, when they hurt, their, hurt their hamstring, you know, they'd be out for two weeks, not one, these kinds of things. Um, later, you know, very active mind, you know, started to cause her not to sleep very well. And her tissues are probably not repairing at the level they would if she was getting, you know, proper deep sleep. You know, again, you see this, you see this in fibromyalgia, um, common and very highly keyed up people that just got uh, such kind of powerful kind of uh, anxiety tone, you know, that sometimes it's hard to actually rest and turn the brain off. Um, and then what ended up happening is that she had a long run of antibiotics for about a year 
um, based on I, I I'm not qu- I'm not quite sure what I think of the line diagnosis, but whether it was real or not, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, what was not done in that process was her, her mitochondria were not protected from Cipro, and Cipro is is just horrible uh, as far as it's it's da- the damage that can occur to mitochondria. I mean, some of the some of the studies looking at this are frightening. Within 10 days, you can see, you know, death products from mitochondria in the bloodstream, and they start to go up rapidly. Um, what's amazing is how effective N-acetylcysteine can be for that by kind of rescuing the, you know, the capacity to make glutathione, providing the rate-limiting agent for rate-limiting a molecule for making glutathione. You know, you can, you can rescue mitochondria in those circumstances. But um, this story, it adds up. You know, I can buy it just on its clinical face. I checked her glutathione levels, though, and they were very low. They were basically in, like, the 10th percentile. And then we checked her genome, and we see that she's got multiple SNPs of G- GSTM. She actually was missing the G- uh, GTTM. I can't remember which one it is. I, sometimes those are, don't roll off the tongue that easily. Um, but... She was actually missing one of the enzymes, which is known to be, uh, a, you know, it, it's not a good thing to be missing that one enzyme. Um, and you put that all together and you got a coherent story. So, yes, the genes were involved, um, but we didn't base it all on that. We also look at the clinical picture and, and try and come up with a story that works and then is clinically correlated, not just clinically correlated, but also correlated to labs and, and genetics. And I think if you can get all three of those pieces in place, you know, you've got a tripod. And I think you can make a fairly, fairly coherent set of decisions about treatment and moving forward. And then, of course, you watch what happens. You know, you have goals. And, and if you're achieving those goals, and then I think it's a pretty reasonable way to practice. I think that at least it tries to use what's available now in ways that are reasonable and mindful of the limitations. So... Okay, so you mentioned a number of things that if we get into it, starts to show how um, complex and multifaceted health and then even specifically uh, neuropsych is. Mm -hmm. And so you said she was on um, antibiotics. Obviously, we can look at the negative effect of antibiotics and then not just antibiotics, but any kind of chemical, right? Whether we're talking about an antibiotic that's in the environment like glyphosate or other kind of petrochemicals in our house environment like volatile organic compounds or other kind of pharmaceuticals we were on. So we can look at all kinds of like pharmaceutical and environmental uh, exposure. And then not just the organic ones, but the inorganic ones like heavy metal exposure. We can look at, you're mentioning Lyme, a whole host of subclinical infections that might be possible in the mouth and the sinuses and the GI tract and the blood, whatever, right? That can all have um, possibly neurologic effects. We can look at things like mold and mycotoxin exposure. We can look at the just purely psychological elements of what's affecting nervous system. We can look at, I mean, <clears throat> we can look at the genetics across many branches, right? Like what's going on with their, with their COMT, their MAOB, or things that are going to be body wide, like methylation, sulfation. So, and even if you just look at methylation, it's you look at the top people working in methylation getting so nuanced in terms of, do I have to treat CBS before COMT, before MTHFR, and do I do any of that, or do I do Walsh kind of just look at their whole blood histamine and treat based off that? So do you have a way that you put all this together? Do you have a kind of a methodology Obviously, you've got people like Bredesen Protocol that are taking some elements and putting it together to look at neuropsych in places like Institute of Functional Medicine. Is there a general protocol or does it really depend upon their clinical presentation? If they show up sore and inflamed versus not, you're going to look at different things. Can you, can you speak to how you start to parse that? Yeah. It would be, you know, this is one of these things I, 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 I for my own sake, I need an acronym really uh, because... It is interesting. Each each person, I think the basic ideas are longitudinally working with someone. Education is is paramount. 
I think if you don't explain what you think is going on and why you think that's going on and what you want to do about it at a level that the patient walks out understanding, you're going to be dead in the water in doing this kind of work because you need the information feedback from the patient as you work with them. And they can't feed back information to you if you don't educate them about what's going on. And you also just get better outcomes at the simplest level. But I think, you know, if we are fine instruments for reading and aggregating complex data, you know, the most, one of the most important things is to have a, a solid rapport with a patient and to, and to be connected to them in terms of the paradigms that are being, that are being applied. So there's that. Um, I remove toxic processes, you know, whether it's somebody that just hasn't gotten the news and is having a tuna fish sandwich every single day of their life and, you know, has, has comp plus plus and, you know, other sign, other reasons to be worried about their mercury levels, you know, things like that, you know, people who drink too much alcohol, you know, get them to understand what that's doing to them and, and get that out of the picture. Um, lifestyle toxicity as well, and, and just interpersonal toxicity as well. You know, those things get back to, you know, a lot of what we were talking about before. Um, and definitely a deep workup. Um, I think everybody deserves that who doesn't feel well. And I very rarely see uh, a broad enough workup to catch all things at the same time. I think it's often done. A lot of times I'll get, I have people gather all of the labs that they can get their hands on. I don't care if they're 30 years old. I just say get every lab that you can possibly get your hands on. And it's great fun. You go through and there'll be a smoking gun from 10 years ago. You'll watch, you'll watch this, the onset of B12 deficiency in their CBCs that nobody's noticed. They've gotten older and they're not absorbing their B12 and you watch their MCV climb and all of a sudden, you know, and I can make the call and I know what's going on before I even check labs. You know, of course I confirm it, but um, so I think that you've got to frame the story of what's happening, not in a moment, but in, but in, you know, over a long, over a, a long period of time, or it's not going to make sense to the individual you're working with. And it really won't make sense to you either because people are, they live in time. So to not see it as a, as something that's occurring. Um, and then like we talked about, I think, you know, you bring in, you know, to some extent, the, the, the kind of linchpin a lot of times will be genetics. Um, you'll get people where it's like, Oh, well, no wonder. And then sometimes you'll get people. It's, it's not that common, but you'll get, I'll get people where I was pretty sure I was going to find something and I don't in their genetics. But you know, when you've got, you know, 500, 700 genomes and you've, you, and you're, if you're good at kind of, again, aggregating data, you get to where you kind of know what you're going to find. Um, and then if you confirm that with labs, then you start making a plan. I use, I have a fairly simple approach. It's, it, it is, uh, uh using a lot of the molecules that you guys use in, in qualia and, and again, energetics and protection from free radicals and um, kind of decrease, decrease aging processes as best as possible with natural molecules. But again, also getting the things out of the story that may be, you know, pushing, pushing their aging rate forward or, you know, sapping their energy, be it body, mind or spirit, you know, so you said something that I'm so happy you said, because I would say maybe all the doctors that come on the show say something similar and almost all doctors, almost all other doctors don't, which is that the main diagnostic tool that you like to use is a really deep clinical intake to create a medical timeline that makes sense. And you can't do that in a five or a 15 minute session. Yeah, yeah. And if you're going to be looking at their labs over the course of years or decades, and not just their labs, but asking about when their symptoms kicked on and what was happening and, oh, did a divorce or a death happen then? Did a moldy house happen then? Is that when their back injury happened? Getting a deep enough like <clears throat> history of both the exposures, the trauma, right. when the symptoms came, and the labs and correlating it. To me, until, until I see that, any kind of confidence I have feels actually scary. Like, I don't want to have a confidence until the whole story makes sense. 
Mm-hmm. And there's just no way to do that quickly. And this is where the economics of medicine right now is a problem. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's frustrating. I, I think it's there, there are so many reasons the system is broken that it's, it's, it's no one group's fault. It's just so complex, you know, the delivery of care and, you know, the kind of, I don't know, the expectations of, of, of patients sometimes to just have there be a simple answer. I mean, people, some, sometimes people don't want this. They don't want it to be this complicated. Yeah. Well, the thing that is so exciting for me is in a world where we treat almost everything that is not acute as incurable, like the, those are the two categories. It's either acute or incurable um, because the non-acute things don't have one cause and the cause is necessarily obvious. And so if we're looking for single obvious cures, it's incurable, right? Um, In that world, when we're looking at autoimmune, neurodegen, cancer, psychiatric dynamics, recognizing that there are actually solutions that can help people is just so exciting coming from the, you just have to be medicated forever or your life's gonna suck. Um, And so, yes, not everyone recognizes that in a system as complex as a human physiology and physiology, psychology, environment complex, that they are going to need to do more than one thing possibly to re- restore balance. Mm-hmm. If, if someone's at all like thinks about it, realistic about it, they get, okay, that makes sense. But that there is actually a path forward is the thing that is so enheartening for me. Yeah. That, that, that's what's, I think can be really unsatisfying about Western medicine. You see a lot of doctors that are frustrated and I feel for them. I mean, they didn't necessarily, they just were not exposed to certain ideas in medical school and we, we can get mad at them, but I, I really think most of the doctors that I know and worked with and studied with and trained with, they all had their hearts in the right place. They wanted to help people and they do a lot of times, but when they bump up against complex kind of syndromic processes of people not feeling well that's occurring through kind of cross physiologic kind of sequela that just moves through different arenas of physiology. It's hard for them to anchor what's going on. Uh, and you know, if you give them, you know, 10, 15 minutes, it's, it, it's would be too much to have anybody asked to do that really. So, so I'm curious, I know your, practice is full and you're really working on developing some new um, technologies to hope, hopefully bring some of the things that you like to wider audiences. Um, if people are interested in finding good integrative practitioners that can do integrative medicine, functional medicine, neuropsych work, um, at Neurohacker, we're actually working on a program to uh, curate doctors that have the best training and train them, but we, that's not released just yet. So for now, our, is there a resource that you can recommend where people can go find practitioners that there's a higher probability will be helpful for them? Yeah. I I think that the integrative boards have done, you know, done a good job of, of training and vetting. And I think that the process that's involved in, in being, you know, a diplomat from ABIHM or, uh, or Institute for Functional Medicine. I mean, that, that is, that's a lot of work um, to move through their process. So somebody's, bother to be certified through them in a psychiatric mode, um, you can be pretty sure that they are interested enough to, 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 to be worth, worth seeing or at least interviewing and, and experiencing what they have to say. Um, I think uh, Andrew Wheel was involved in this early on and he has his, his fellowship and you can see who, you know, who's gone through his fellowship and is in whatever city you're in. And so I think there's growing resources to kind of vet on that front and and see at least some filters, put some filters in place and, and find doctors. Now, when you go in and see them, you have to use your own intuition and and experience to determine whether you want to keep working with them, of course, but, uh, but it's a place to start at least. And if after listening to this, people are curious to explore more about if, um, if ketamine therapy is appropriate for them, what would they look for to find a practitioner that might be a good practitioner? 
So one, one of the interesting web resources is the Ketamine, Ketamine Advocacy Network, uh, which was started by patients that had had such profound experience during research that they ended up, I'm not actually quite sure how they found each other, uh, but they started a, an advocacy uh, community uh, to A, get the word out, you know, B, to some extent, I think they were worried about access and uh, felt that it was important that their voices be out there so that, uh, you know, this didn't get locked up, you know, before doctors had a chance to learn how effective it was. Uh, so there's ketamine, ketamine ad advocacy network. And I think that you can sometimes find, you know, doctor's names in user groups and things like that. Uh, there is the society for ketamine. Let's see. So ketamine society, society for ketamine providers. I believe it's started by Stephen Mandel uh, and, uh, and uh, Stephen Levine. Um, put this together to kind of bring practitioners together uh, so that they could be a sharing ideas, be having a place to, you know, put hang a shingle essentially. Um, and I don't know that they do any specific vetting. I can't speak to, you know, that they're determining that it's a high quality clinic, but I know that a lot of uh, practitioners do, uh, do register with them. And, you know, nowadays, really, honestly, you can Google and find it's just it's just popping up all over the place. I would always encourage people to uh, understand that if somebody's just started, you know, that you might you might want to just know a little bit more. Uh, they might be wonderful at what they do, or you know, it might be you know an opportunistic uh, you know clinic. It's 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 just any process like this, you know, just due diligence. And uh, just a fun thought in closing for this session, when you think about the future of integrative psychiatry and uh, all the different aspects of physiology from genomics to clinical chemistry to the various sources of underlying cause to working with neurochemistry directly and all of the types of psychology integration across them, what would you say you, what are some of the, things that you're most excited about on the horizon emerging? Well, really what we, what we've been talking about, which is this, this new, these new modes of data, you know, inquiry, the ability to pull down such large amounts of data. Um, like we said, I, there's some limits to genomics and, and, you know, SNP analysis. But I think if we, uh, put computers to work and we marry symptoms and history of symptoms over time with labs and genetics, I think we will be able to provide people answers that work and answers that use natural, natural leverage, you know, molecules or meditation or these kinds of things. And, and not only that, but prove that it works so that we can kind of stop defending ourselves within the functional space that, that, you know, it actually really does help to, you know, give CoQ10 and carnitine to people that are tired and, and things like that. I don't have enough time to do the research at the level that would be required to prove this to doctors that are used to studies with hundreds and hundreds of patients, but you see it in your practice every day when you, when you do it. So I look forward to, you know, to our field, you know, being legitimized with larger numbers and, and, you know, a lot of what you do with computer, computer science and the systems analysis, really. Yeah, being able to not just do clinical trials on things that we currently don't have clinical trials, but also not everyone's going to respond the same way to acetylcarnitine or CoQ10 to know for whom it's right and not just right. have a clinical trial on a molecule, but clinical right. trials on processes of identifying which things to do for which people, which starts to get into the personalized medicine and equals one optimization process. That's, mm -hmm. that is the kind of like bioinformatics meets yeah. um, biosciences that is super exciting. Yeah. It's, it's very hopeful. I, I think it, it is always humbling to, apply everything you know and get it wrong with someone and you know hopefully you know the more data that we can pull together the more 
in the more we can kind of quantify and and gather outcomes, the less less mistakes we'll make as doctors, even when we're doing our best, you know. Jeffrey, thank you so much for uh, being on the podcast, for sharing with us. These are fascinating topics and your experience from, uh, you know, medical doctor, psychiatrist to someone studying mysticism and really looking at what's happening at the intersection of this physiology thing and this yeah. uh, psycho-spiritual thing. Um, really novel, valuable perspective to share with us. So I, I appreciate your time and I appreciate the work you've been doing. Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate you too. You good work. And, and we will, um, I look forward to being able to take some of these conversations deeper in the future. Thank you. Take care, my friend. Thank you for listening to Collective Insights. For the full show notes on this episode and for more great interviews, visit us at neurohacker.com slash collective insights. If you like this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Want to learn a better strategy for mental well-being? We designed a beautifully illustrated 32-page guide integrating care for your mind, brain, body, and environment into a balanced approach for a better life. Download the foundational guide to neurohacking at neurohacker.com backslash guide.